Galatians 4, and we were, we were looking at it in light of the prodigal son and the elder son being heirs to uh, what the father, um, his, the wording there, at least in the King James, is, James is his living, father's living. And um, we were, we're, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to discover the heart of the father because the story of the prodigal son doesn't give a lot. And the, our heavenly father doesn't either in the sense of complain or show hurt or, you know, you, you know that sort of stuff. We're trying to discover that. And uh, Galatians is helping us, but um, Scott, during the break, shared something, and I think it'd be good if uh, he could just read that to, to us here also. Scott? I was just uh, thinking about what Randy was saying about how we wound the Father, and it uh, made me think of uh, Genesis where Judah is interceding for uh, to, to Joseph for, for Benjamin, and he says, Now therefore, when, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with, with us, since his life is bound up with the lad's life, it will happen when he, he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servant will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. And, and I was just, you know, th thinking, you know, how we don't, you know, Judah saw this he saw I cannot go to my father without the son of his love I cannot just go to him my father and my father is not just going to be a little disappointed it will kill him it will it will destroy him it will wound him so deeply and um, and I just you know we, we don't understand how it hurts the father when we come to him with anything less than the son of his love Yeah, I've, uh, as I've said, this what we're sharing right now, and will be for a couple of weeks, maybe it could, it could go faster than that. Um, has to do with the bridge to where this whole thing really is going to matter, where it's really we're, we're going to really see the Lord in this. But um, in my study, and which has been all over the place in preparation, <clears throat> I had noticed. Um, that um, that Judah and Levi both had made stands for God or for the Father in in their walk with the Lord, and Judah here in those scriptures has grasped the a deep reality of, of the person we call God, but Jesus calls him Father, and we should call him Father. He's grasped something deeply. And, um, and so the result of it is, is that Judah, as well as another place, Levi, and most of you are familiar with Levi in there, they ended up getting... Um, I'm going to say it like this. They ended up getting the inheritance as if of being a firstborn. And Levi, as we know, the tribe of Levi, which neither one of these were firstborn sons, the tribe of Levi became, and if, you've, if any of you have tried to follow any of my sharings on Zadok, became the priestly Lineage, lineage, the line, and that family, that family uh, became that line of the priesthood. Um, and I need to hold back on saying that. But Judah, because, I mean, the father wants to give his inheritance to the firstborn gave to Judah not a firstborn, but a firstborn in the eyes of the father, the royal line, 
the royal blood, the royal family, through which Jesus came and then it all came together, both priesthood, priest and king and prophet. Um, so I say this stuff to say you can't imagine how important this is where we're heading because it's going to, it's just, it's like reaches out to just every area. And, and think about this. Why wouldn't it? Because it's really related to the Father and the Son who were before the foundation of the world. Who was it? Robert or somebody was talking, said something maybe within the last two weeks and said something like uh, Jesus' prayer at the end, John 17. Father, I pray that they will be one the way you and I are one. And that was his big prayer. That was his impress, you know. I mean, he, you know, he said a few things on the cross and Father, forgive it. But when he could just pray as a son and for the, for the thing that he's doing as a firstborn son. It was bring them into the way that we are. Okay. That was heavy on Jesus' heart. You see from what Scott read, that's heavy on Judah's heart for the Father. I can't do this. I cannot do this. Judah's saying that. I can't do this to my Father. It, I must bring back the Son, and I will say that it is the Son of His love. We'll, we'll get into a bunch of this. It is the son of his love, the beloved son of the father, Benjamin. Okay. All right, so we're looking in Galatians 4, and Galatians 4 is give, starting to um, lay, lay a robe of a mantle of revelation over us of the heart of the father from this angle, what we just talked about is the heart of the Father from another angle, but all, all pointing, all moving in one direction. And the heart of the Father is, um, you, you, you know, you think you're ready, but you are immature. And and he says, I, I want you under servants. Now. Is that important? What was the one thing that started changing the heart of the father towards the prodigal when he said, I am not worthy to be a son. Make me like one of the servants. And bingo began right there to open up a whole new world and a whole new realization of what the father had on his hands. He had a son in making, and the father needed to do his part now. Okay. So the father put, wants us under tutors and governors, and, and I will tell you that that pattern is absolutely necessary, and it's not just in, in under tutors and governors, but there is a process, and I hope that I can, because I see it, and I just hope I get time to be able to chart some of this to show you the incredible follow-through that, the, that is in the scriptures on this over and over. <clears throat> um, until he's, but he's there until the time appointed of the father. Okay, so it didn't say until the time appointed of the tutor or the governor. It says they are there because the father knows his son. The father knows his son, and the father is going to have a time period. And you, you notice it says, how, you know, how long? As long as he is a child, he differeth nothing from a servant. How long? As long as, depending on, that depends on you. And, you know, it can take 20 years. It can take 40 years in the wilderness. It could take six months. But, it's, but the, the thing you have to realize is 
in all the cases where you find this, it's different because it's as long as. But there are some of the same elements uh, uh, that are necessary. And if we skip those steps, if we skip those steps, if we skip that, and we press on like the prodigal son, give me my inheritance now because I think I'm mature enough. Then it, it doesn't end well. And the father knows where it's going to end. It always ends in the hog pen. <laughs> it always ends there. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, and then verse uh, 6, And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, this verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, not just an heir. And the prodigal son is just an heir, but he's not an heir of God through Christ. So it doesn't qualify. So he's not really an heir at all. He's a thief. And he's stolen the father's goods. And he probably doesn't know it. In fact, I'm going to tell you, judging from his words when he came back, I've sinned against heaven and before you, Father. Something dawned about the father. Okay, so this, this, we talk a lot about, well, it's in the scriptures, obviously, um, in uh, Romans 8 and verse 28 and 29, being conformed to the image of his son. Okay, so th these things are important because that's what God wants. So if you take everything that most Christians are doing <laughs> and where their focus is and where their emphasis is and you put them in a basket, the father would walk off from it and go find his son. And that's what the, the scriptures that Scott read were. Judah recognizing that, recognizing how extremely important that is and you have to remember that, uh, in my opinion, the two sons of Rachel, which, you know, was Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph was the one with the coat of many colors. Joseph was the one that was beaten. Joseph was the one who was sent down into Egypt. Joseph was the one who, even in Egypt, was made a slave in a house and then eventually was um, in a dungeon. Joseph, as far as the father knew, was dead. Represents Christ crucified. Benjamin was the other son. And at that time, the only begotten son, if you will, um, of Rachel and Jacob, was still alive and he's he's going I don't you know and we'll get into all this but he's he's just going you know I don't want to send my son back down there I don't I don't want to you know if he dies I'll die because in his heart Joseph was dead he reckoned him dead but he was risen if you will he was alive in Egypt. The father didn't know it. Didn't know that. So he's holding on to the son of his love, Benjamin. All right. So um, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then you're an heir. Okay. Um, so I, I wrote down, uh, the prodigal son was too impatient to wait on death to bring about the things of God. Too impatient to really wait on death, to let death have its perfect work, to let that death of Christ and your uh, grasp beyond grasp, my God, um, 
your death be settled. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified. My God, I am crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Um, uh, I'm dead. But just to make sure, I'm crucified. My hands are not my own anymore. To just reach and touch and do and feel and, and, and build and, and develop ministry and do all of this stuff. And my feet are not mine just to run anywhere that I think God wants me to without death. Without death. Without a realization of... Um, See, I don't think we connect the death of Christ with, with being an heir. I don't think we do that. I don't think the prodigal connected it. I think he just thought, I'm supposed to get stuff, and I want it early, and I want it now. And so he said, give it to me, and left. And no matter how good we think we are with God's stuff, if death is not the, the main factor that we're living by, because, because if we're dead, Christ will live in us. But as long as we're alive, you can't serve two masters, you know. You'll try to obey him, but, you know, if he says, take my feet, because where his body is crucified body, take my feet and go over there. Go, no, I think I'd rather go over here. Or... Oh, here's the, here's the killer. Oh, I have a good idea. <laughs> I have a, or I have a great idea. Because, you know, we're pretty full of ourselves, you know. I have a great idea. And who would think that that would be like reaching up and slapping the father in the face? Because you couldn't wait on the appointed time of the father. Because you couldn't be patient in death. You couldn't, you know... Um, lay down into Jesus' death and stay there until God raised his son in you. God raised his son in you. God raised his son in you. Again, how long does that take? As long as. <laughs> My God. Come on. For some of you, it's going to take a long, 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 long time. It doesn't have to. All it takes is... You know, see, we go, I'm going to take my hands off of stuff then. <laughs> you still got your hands. They're still your hands. You don't understand. You know, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm not going to do anything anymore. I'm just going to be at the Lord. I'm going to search the scripture without holding my Bible with my hands. <laughs> you know, that, that's our kind of dedication. <laughs> you, know? you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm serious. You know, you need to be seriously dead. No, there is no inheritance. There is no inheritance. And here's the kicker. There's no son, the son. There's no the son. It's a son trying to be what we think God wants and violating the father, the father's plan, the progression that is absolutely necessary, and if there's nothing else that I have been more convinced of in this search, it is there is an over and over and over and over pattern that is absolutely necessary. It, it may be uh, formulated a little different for you and you and you and you and you and you and you, but it's a, there's a basic pattern there. You may not recognize it in someone else. Let's just say that what if, we, what if that pattern has been there all this time throughout the, the scriptures and we never saw the pattern? What if we say that? And I'm convinced that the only way to see the pattern is to see the Father's heart. And the only way to see the Father's heart is to begin to acknowledge what is evident. The Father wants his Son I want what the Father wants. I want the Son, but now my question is, do I want the Son unto death? <laughs> you know, 
Do I want the son in, in his death? And there is, there's almost nowhere you can go if, if you say no to that. I mean, I mean, yes. We can build American churches, which by the way, in the Bible, there was never any church buildings. They never went out and built church buildings. Well, we could go on and on, but. <clears throat> Um, and we can say we didn't build this church building. <laughs> and we can cop out on a million fronts. But the point is, is that they were after the Lord, period, however that meant, whatever that meant. And the American church is no different than the African church or any other church. We will build it according to our pattern and what we think it's supposed to be. And then we'll get enough people that will agree with us and then we will say God agrees with us. <laughs> God agrees with us because I have the mouth of two or three witnesses. I mean, witnesses, what did I say? <laughs> it, is, it is a thing of the heart, but it's the heart of the Father. It's the heart of the Father. And, you know, just in closing, which, well, let me just read this. The prodigal son was skipping the death. And this is what some seek to do. This is what some seek to do. You know, I was raised in several foster homes, three foster homes, <clears throat> then was put in an orphanage for, from 11 to 15. Uh, so I didn't really know much about a father. I knew, I knew a little of my father and a little, you know, a little more, I guess you could say, of my stepfather. Um, but all I knew was meanness and cruelty and violence and all of that. And uh, Blake, when we were down in, in uh, Houston, reminded me, he said, I was listening to one of your classes and I heard what you were brought up with. And he said, and I heard you say that you didn't know how to be a father, and so it was going to have to be the father through you. And I thought, wow, I mean, it hit me all of a sudden that while that sounds so <laughs> really great, and it does, if we don't know the father, you know, God who spared not his own son, listen to that. God who spared not his own son. We're going to go, a good father makes sure that nothing bad ever happens. You know, that everything is as good and sweet. But folks, and that's, that's today. I'm sorry I'm going longer here, but that's today. My God, you know, they're trying to make it where, you know, the, the kids are playing soccer and, you know, get, you get there late and you go, what's the score? And they go, oh. We don't have scores. Uh, we don't count scores because everyone's a winner, you know. And I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm looking at little Johnny. I say, he's over there chasing butterflies instead of playing the game. You better talk to him about being a winner. Anyway, you know, we, we got all of this stuff, you know. They said, somebody said that <clears throat> they don't use a red pen to mark your paper things that are wrong anymore. They won't use red because red just says, you know, um, it, it messes with their, uh, what, what is it? Self-esteem. And, um, and so we want them to, and then if they, you know, get older and they see red, they'll go, ah, you know, like this stuff. You know, we wouldn't want to mess with their self-esteem and stuff like that. I'm thinking, you know, like when I went to school, what was, we made grades, right? A, you remember that one? What's the next one? Okay, what's the next one? Okay, what's the next one? And what's the next one? Not E. We, we failed so bad they skipped a letter. And it blatantly said, you failed. <laughs> you know what I mean? We need highs and lows we need to 
experienced failure. And some of the greatest men in the world, out of their failures, went on, you know. We need, in the Lord, we need to be able to suffer for others, to weep for others. We need it, you know. And so everybody's trying to, you know, compassionately keep everyone from anything that might. But, you know, my God, you know, we can't pray everything away. Can I get amen? I mean, somebody said, you know, would you pray for my son? Was he sick or in the hospital? No, he's... Uh, He's in a karate tournament, and uh, there's a chance that he could win. Could you pray for, for my son? I'm going, you know. I mean, I just wanted to go, oh, Lord, just make his foot go right up and kick the teeth out of the guy that he's, he's going up against, and just bring him down, you know. Right? I heard that. Blake was sharing something of a guy that was talking about that. And I just, you know, everyone was laughing. And I was just going, oh, Lord, no. Why do we have to pray for everything to turn out perfect when God may be at work to take us down, to, be, to bring us into servanthood that's hard on us until we learn Christ? And then... You serve seven years for a wife, and it says one day, you know, in the Old Testament. I was just shocked at people laughing at that story because I was just going, oh, my God, this is horrible. This is horrible. So may the Lord, may the Lord continue to, and the, by the power of the Spirit of God, continue to move us into things that's like a new realm. It's like, I'm going to say it like this, it's out of Christianity and into the heart of God. You okay with that? Yes. Out of Christianity and into the heart of God. You'll come closer to being and doing and feeling and all this of what the Lord wants. And maybe even find out what it means to be a firstborn. Father, we just ask you to continue to breathe. Breathe your life, your heart, your thoughts. And if, they, if you can't breathe them into us because of where we're at and we're scared or we're stubborn or whatever, then breathe them in our direction so that we can hear more than teaching, more than words, and we can we can be challenged enough to say, okay, I, I, I'm at least open to be challenged. But Father, some of us want more than being challenged. We, were, we are ready to give it all up to have you. To have you. So continue to move. Continue to move. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right.